Good morning. Welcome to the Community Church in Chapel Hill, Unitarian Universalist. And um, I have to say that I am proud that we took 109 people on our two church buses to Washington, D.C., and we got all 109 back (laughs) to Chapel Hill. Although not all 109 of them have been in church this morning, so... For those of us who are adherents of liberal religion in America, wrote Rabbi Eric Yaffe a few weeks ago, for those of us who are adherents of liberal religion in America, this is our moment. He continues, for most of us, after all, religion remains the primary source from which our values derive. At a time when technology and frequent job moves have left us bereft of community, it is our congregations that fill the gap. Other clubs and civic associations have faltered, but churches and synagogues remain strong and robust. They are the places that extend a loving hand to every embattled soul, the one place that cares about you as an individual. They are the places where Americans turn for help in raising their children and in connecting with the sacred They are the places where no one suffers alone or grieves alone. The liberal congregations are especially important at this moment because of their belief that religion always involves concern for the poor and the needy and giving a fair shake to all. Liberal churches and synagogues say that, yes, we must pray with fervor and read the Bible with diligence. I'll just pause here and say that ours doesn't really say that very much. But... uh, that Eric, was, Eric wasn't speaking for us, really, Rabbi, Rabbi Eric. Liberal churches and synagogues say that, yes, we must pray with fervor and read the Bible with diligence, but without concern for justice, they remind us, there can be no authentic spirituality or wisdom. To talk about God and ignore justice is wrong, and to cloak yourself in religion and forget mercy is blasphemous. <clears throat> Rabbi Yaffe wrote this as, the past president for the Union for Reform Judaism, the largest and most diverse Jewish movement in North America. And his editorial about this moment being liberal religion's moment is one of the more than a dozen pieces of reportage that have crossed my desk over the past 10 weeks, proclaiming or promoting or crossing their fingers and praying for the rise, the renewal, the resurrection of liberal religion in our nation in this moment. Some of those articles have documented the spike in attendance at worship services over the past several months, the surge of people visiting liberal religious congregations for the first time or returning after having drifted away. And we're ourselves here in Chapel Hill, we're witnessing that trend here at Community Church where we've seen a dramatic surge in attendance and an uptick in the number of visitors and the largest sign-up to date for our Exploring Membership class next week. Other articles point out the pivotal role that liberal religious institutions have played in historic victories for justice and for social change, how progressive religious people and institutions were at the center of many liberation movements, civil rights movements, and other movements for social change. And still other articles and editorials exhort liberal religion to be a bolder, more courageous, more visible, more powerful player in American public life in this moment. As one was titled, We Were Made for Times Like These. And if I'm allowed to be 100% truthful and 100% honest, I'm not exactly happy about this. I'd actually much rather that this not be the case. I would, I would kind of prefer that it not be liberal religion's moment. I would prefer very much so that our own society and our world be so deeply interfused with justice and with fairness and with kindness and understanding that liberal religion was regarded as superfluous and redundant and commonplace. And I have to tell you, as much as I would like to say that it feels good to receive compliments for the sermons I've delivered over the past several weeks, and there's been kind of a spike in that positive feedback that has gone on even as there's been that spike in visitors, I would much prefer to preach poor and low-stake sermons about trivial matters. I would much prefer that 
than sermons where I feel an urgent need. I'm reminded of a truth from the Jewish and Christian scriptures that there are many, many stories of reluctant prophets because deep down, no prophet really wants the job. <laughs> and so we're living in what may in, turn, may in fact turn out to be liberal religion's moment. And so this morning, I thought what I would do is I would spend some time talking about what it is that, that might lie at the core of liberal religion. And in defining liberal, we might keep in mind two definitions for the word, and I think these two definitions go hand in hand. One of those definitions is that liberal has to do with, with the sense of being, of being free. It has to do with freedom, words like liberty and liberation. And even, and even the liberal arts, which is to say a broad and free inquiry across diverse fields of knowledge as opposed to a focused or narrow preparation in a specific discipline. Liberal arts are kind of the free, the free search. The other definition is that liberal is not only synonymous with freedom, but it's synonymous with generosity. If a restaurant review tells you that the restaurant serves liberal portions, <laughs> you, know, you know what that means, right? It's the opposite of stingy or scarce or being fearfully or greedily withheld. You know, I was at this poor party and the drinks were being poured liberally. <laughs> it, talks about a, it, it talks about abundance, right? As I speak about the core of liberal religion, I want to turn to the writings of, of one of the foremost Unitarian theologians of the past century, James Luther Adams. And when I say I'm going to talk about the theology of James Luther Adams, I know some of you are prepared to tune out this portion of the sermon. Um, but, but Adams was not some abstract difficult thinker. Um, his thought was, was deeply informed by his social and his historical context, in, in particular his travels to Germany during the, the early stages of the rise of, of fascism influenced his theological work and his thinking, and in turn his writing influenced a generation of liberal religious thinkers. One of James Luther Adams' most influential pieces explored what he called the five smooth stones of liberal religion. The five smooth stones of liberal religion. These, these five smooth stones are a reference to the biblical story of David and Goliath, where it said that David went to battle with Goliath carrying only five smooth stones for his slingshot that he plucked out of a creek bed. And so like David's stones, these, these five smooth stones of liberal religion don't seem powerful, but when used in the right way, they have a power far beyond what, what may seem to be true. The first smooth stone of liberal religion, according to James Luther Adams, is that revelation and truth are not closed, but constantly revealed. Revelation is continuous. This idea calls us to a place of openness and humility, and it calls us to hold new learning in high esteem and use responsibility in how we seek after truth. We respond to this idea that revelation is continuous with a posture of openness and curiosity. Other religions, we don't regard as a threat to us. They have something to teach us if only we have the wisdom to listen. And other cultures, other cultures are not scary and foreign, but are beautiful. And we respond with humility, knowing that we only know a small part of the truth and we are not yet fully wise. We respond with appreciation for new learning and discovery, new findings in astronomy or evolution, neuroscience or particle physics. They, those thrill us when we hear there's been a new breakthrough in particle physics. We think, oh, that's interesting, right? And if they undermine the old way of thinking, that's all the better. The stone that teaches us that revelation is continuous is small, but it has the power to shatter frozen ways of thinking. It has the power to reorient us. The second smooth stone of liberal religion, in the words of James Luther Adams, is that all relations between persons ought ideally to rest on mutual free consent and not coercion. 
This is an affirmation of freedom in our interrelatedness. This smooth stone calls on us to resist coercion and tyranny. It calls on us to honor covenantal relationships and reminds us that covenant is the basis for a free community. The second smooth stone calls on us to promote democracy and is the basis for the free church tradition of which Unitarian Universalism is a part. This concept was, was on display yesterday, all around on the signs as um, I went to the, the Women's March in D.C., where, where over a million people um, were there with me. And there was this, this message of, of free of a free consent and not coercion as the basis for the ethics in this world that we want, as the basis for sexual ethics, as the basis for reproductive justice, as the basis for, for marriage equality, as the basis for, for what it means to be free. The third smooth stone, according to James Luther Adams, is, quote, affirmation of the moral obligation to direct one's efforts towards the establishment of a just and loving community. We have a moral obligation to work for justice. Our own Unitarian Universalist tradition has always prized this work as an expression of faith. Our tradition has liberal portions of social reformers of seemingly every stripe, abolitionists like Theodore Parker and Julia Ward Howe, educators like Horace Mann, suffragists, like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, pioneers in medical service, like Clara Barton, the founder of the Red Cross, civil rights activists like James Reeb and Viola Liuzzo, marriage equality activists, immigration activists, and more. Our theology affirms that our religious task can't just be to get your own soul right with God. We gotta, as it's been said in more common parlance, we gotta get free together. We got to get free together. The fourth smooth stone, and this is a great one. And when I said that, when I said that you wouldn't groan at his theological language, um, you'll, you'll groan at this one because this is not artfully worded. It says the fourth smooth stone is denial of the immaculate conception of virtue and affirmation of the necessity of social incarnation. That's obvious. I'll just move on to the no. Um, what he means, what he means is 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 two things. Two things. Um, the first is that good does not happen by accident, but it must be consciously given form and power within history. It means that an affirmation has been said. You know, if you're gonna, you, you gotta, you gotta pray with your hands. You can't just pray for an end to hunger. Somebody actually has to roll up their sleeves and cook the food at the soup kitchen. Um, there's no immaculate conception of virtue. But it also means, it also means that, that, that good does not happen out of nowhere, but good actually happens out of a larger context and a larger reality, which actually allows the, the good to happen. We tend to see, and this is across liberals, and I think James Luther Adams is here, that we tend to see good and bad as, um, as sort of socially informed constructs. When, when, something, when something good happens, we tend to thank the, the systems around that has supported that good thing. And when something bad happens, we tend to say, you know, in what ways has, have the systems and structures of society Cause that, cause that thing to happen. I think that's why we have so many people who come to Unitarian Universalism from the School of Social Work and from the School of Public Health. Is because these understandings, you know, there are true. We tend to be in favor of rehabilitative justice and restorative justice, not punitive justice. If you've been successful, it's most likely because there were some factors in your favor. And if you haven't been, it's probably because there were some factors going against you. And finally, the fifth smooth stone. And again, he gets into the, uh, the language that is inelegant. The fifth smooth stone for James Luther Adams. The resources, divine and human, 
that are available for achievement of meaningful change justify an attitude of ultimate but not necessarily immediate optimism. And what he means, what he means is that the world as it is, both us human, the world as, as, as sacred, justifies in us an attitude of optimism, an attitude of hope, not necessarily immediate hope, but hope over time, hope over the duration. We are the people who believe in hope. As Rob Hardy's, my colleague in D.C., puts it, Together we can cultivate hope. Hope is a journey. In order to be hopeful, we must constantly work at it. It is a difficult path through a beautiful and sometimes broken world. However, it is not a journey we take alone. We are in this together. Let's do the good that we can in the places where we can get involved, cultivate a spiritual practice. Together we can cultivate hope. Or as... My colleague John Buren's put it. That resistance to what is wrong with, through acts of love is more possible when people ground their lives in more than outrage and grief, but in a deep affirmation of life's goodness, in celebration of life's beauty, and in receptivity to grace. Albert Camus observed in The Rebel that underneath the no of every true protest, there is a deeper yes the apprehension of life's goodness provides a foundation for emotional aliveness and moral clarity. Yes, it fuels outrage and protest and social critique, but at the same time, it sustains us through refreshing experiences of beauty and joy. So those five smooth stones that revelation is continuous, truth is evolving, that we're called to be a, a free community and a free society in which our relationships are based on, on consent and not coercion. That justice is an essential part of the liberal spiritual practice. That good doesn't just happen, but it happens within a larger context that makes it possible. And that there is always, always a cause for hope. So as you think about those five smooth stones and about how we live them, did you see yourself reflected in them at all? Do you, do you kind of think that way a little bit? He's a smart guy. I wonder what it would mean. What would it mean for us if this is to be liberal religion's moment? What would that mean for, for you and me? What would that mean for this church? What would it mean for the children we, we seek to raise with the values and the character that we care about? What would it mean for what we provide them? What would it mean for how we gather, how we welcome, how we park our cars? What would it mean for this to be liberal religion's moment? As for me, I will keep that commitment, that commitment to a truth that is being continuously revealed, that commitment to a free community and the difficult practice of covenant, that commitment to justice, that commitment to a context to a context that breeds greater health, greater love, greater happiness. And I'll keep that commitment to hope, that hope that we see all around the world, that hope that we see with pink hats and picket signs, that hope we see in the liberal religious community when it comes together and is what it is supposed to be. May it be so, and let us make it so. Amen and blessed be.